since early March, our session marches on. It's actually finishing uh, very quickly on the 18th. There's a lot of things to go. And one of them is the what we've been reporting on for a bit now is the alcohol tax that met its doom in uh, HB 230, specifically in the House Taxation and Revenue Committee, same on the Senate side, but we may have some action in the omnibus tax bill you saw Gwyneth Dolan reporting on earlier this week for New Mexico in Focus. So we want to circle back with our guy, Ted Alcorn. Ted sat down with us back in mid-February with some other experts in the field of dealing with the results of alcohol, frankly. <laughs> and he wrote a seven-part series that I very much want you folks to go over, even though we're still in the middle of this fight. It's important. Ted, welcome back to New Mexico in Focus. I really appreciate your time today. Always happy to be here. Absolutely. Now, I mentioned HB 230. It was at, it was tabled in committee. What happened there? You've been streaming from where you are. Were you first, were you surprised? And second, what were the, what was some of the arguments you heard that made it go down and, and be tabled in that one committee? Well, as you remember, in 2017, advocates brought a very similar bill seeking a quarter uh, drink tax increase. And the measure is meant to impact New Mexico's alcohol crisis in two different ways. It's supposed to raise revenue, obviously, that could be spent on alcohol treatment and prevention, but it's also supposed to marginally increase the price of alcohol uh, to discourage people from, from drinking excessively. And there's a lot of research from around the country where states have shown this to, to have that impact. In 2017, the advocates couldn't get the bill through its first committee, um, despite a year-long effort to do so. This year was really different. They came in, um, there's a number of bills related to alcohol that have been introduced, and the tax bill that you're referring to was the most ambitious, again, seeking a, a similar flat 25 cents a drink um, tax. And it, it made it out of its health committee. Uh, and then the tax committees in both the Senate and the House tabled it. Now, they table those bills as a matter of course so that they can consider all the bills that have a fiscal impact and put them into their omnibus tax bill at the end. And, and in this case, that's what's occurred, sort of. Uh, the bill that ended up or the, the language that ended up showing up, at least on the House side in the omnibus tax bill, um, includes an alcohol harms alleviation fund. It includes an increase in alcohol tax, but it's a great deal smaller than the sponsors had originally sought. Instead of achieving that 25 cent alcohol uh, per drink flat tax, this is talking, this is looking at about a one penny to two penny increase. So um, the sponsors have been telling me that they're hopeful that the Senate version will establish a stronger increase. They're talking now about a compromise and maybe a 15 cent uh, increase in, in the alcohol tax on the on the Senate side, but it really remains to be seen. And there's a long way to go for both of these bills before they're uh, reconciled and turned into law. Good point there. And I, again, I mentioned the ticking clock as it goes with our legislature. So that's a difficulty. Um, for the folks who may not have caught our first interview around, and we'll have a, 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 that link down below here, uh, my first go around with Ted and other guests about this, help us clarify about where taxes sit for certain kinds of drinks, because that's been an issue right now, too, because everything's sort of all over the place, depending on what you're serving. It's, to it's totally obscure, and even the lawmakers have trouble making sense of the statutes that they're looking at, because these laws are written with a tax rate set per gallon of beer or per liter of, of uh, liquor, and it's not necessarily a unit you're familiar with buying in as a consumer. But um, when you do the math right now, on, at the state level, we pay about four cents per 12 ounce beer in state taxes, up to the, at the height seven cents per shot of hard spirits. Mm -hmm. um, so these are pretty small amounts. And because they are set by the volume of alcohol, every year inflation eats away at them a little bit more. The prices of alcohol, like everything, have been going up. This tax has stayed the same. And that's why since this, the legislature has not touched these tax rates in 30 years, they have they are effectively half of what they used to be in 1994. Um, so there's a lot of deliberation over whether they're too little or too high and what kind of increase would be appropriate. But I think most of the legislators looking at them say, you know, we tax a lot of different industries. This industry's taxes have fallen by half. Why is that the case? Mm -hmm. Interesting point there, very interesting point, because the real value of something is something we do have to consider. That's a, actually a very interesting point. The liquor lobby has come out in force, as was not unexpected, certainly. But I'm, I'm curious where you sit, what you gleaned from watching some of the opposition and hearing some of the quotes from folks in the, in the liquor lobby about what this excise tax would potentially do to bars, restaurants. 
a lot of stuff going floating around out there. That's for sure. Yeah, well, the bill, the original language of the bill was going to apply this flat tax rate to all producers. And for for years, we've given preferential tax treatment to microbrewers, small wine growers, local distillers. Um, and this, the original language of the bill would have eliminated that distinction. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you definitely see a lot of the local and well-known and popular breweries um, and the New Mexico Brewers Guild Distillers Guild coming out in opposition, but the real big guns here are the the national or even global companies that sell alcohol in New Mexico, and we know nationwide uh, that the alcohol business is really concentrated. The businesses that make the most money on this are Anheuser Busch, InBev, which is you know sells fifty billion dollars in alcohol around the world. Um, and they have been amongst the most vocal opponents and they're, uh, they're there at the hearings and they made arguments that would, you know, be familiar to anybody who watched this bill go down in flames in 2017, that it would hurt small businesses. Um, they've also argued that a, a consumption tax like this is regressive mm -hmm. and therefore it could harm poorer people. Um, one of the one of the members of the Senate Tax Committee uh, said that she was happy to see business going after a bill for, uh, for being a regressive tax, and she really hoped that industry would be there in the future to also support other kinds of progressive taxation, I think in a kind of tongue-in-cheek remark. Mm -hmm. um, but no, in, indeed, there's been, these hearings have been full of the voices of both supporters and opponents. Um, Mike, uh, my colleagues at New Mexico in depth have done some great reporting to show, though, that one of the forces behind the scenes here isn't just the comments that are being made, but the people who are making it, because the alcohol industry is hired among the top lobbyists in Santa Fe for uh, to, to represent their interests there. And we uh, we did the math on the political contributions and the alcohol industry has given about three quarters of a million dollars to New Mexican legislatures in the last 10 years. That's a figure that the public health advocates supporting this policy measure cannot match. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a, that's a fact right there. That's a lot of money. Um, it comes down to what the general public sometimes feels as well. I don't think I've seen any polling out there or anything. Have you had, a, is there anything out there that You've seen the take a temperature of where the public is in New Mexico on this issue? I haven't seen any polling recently. In 2017, the advocates supporting an alcohol tax increase did their own polling, which they released, showing that there was support for an increase on this, particularly when people knew that the, the measure was going to be raising revenue to support alcohol treatment and prevention efforts. And, it, and indeed, this bill would not only increase revenues that would be used for treatment services, but um, now the language is looking like we'll direct more of the existing tax revenues that we already collect to those kinds of services. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, legislators don't, they definitely don't govern by the polls. And I'm, I'm not sure what information that they're getting or feeling from their constituents. I'll say in my reporting, it is remarkable uh, the number of people that you end up speaking with about alcohol issues who, who, who it has had a deep impact on them personally and profoundly. Um, but I think people are a little bit skeptical as well about whether an alcohol tax alone can take care of the state's alcohol problems, which are deep-seated and generational. That's a very fair point you just made at the end there. And there's been a lot of quotes from Legislators who are opposed to this saying the typical, you know, people are going to drink anyway, no matter what it costs, you know, all that kind of a thing. But the fact remains, Ted, in your reporting and your local partners here as well, one in 11 deaths in New Mexico 2021 were alcohol related. And there's a feeling out there that might even be a low percentage when you really sort of parse out, you know, what happens with alcohol in a home. Is it that we don't understand how bad the problem is here? In, in some regards, I, I wonder if there's an education that needs to happen with some of our part-time legislators about just how bad this problem is for us. The stats don't lie and they are indeed shocking. I mean, uh, I think part of why we don't always observe the harms of alcohol with our own eyes is because mm -hmm. it's a stigmatized uh, condition, alcohol dependence. And when people are really uh, harmed by it and they're really you know, what physically uh, injured or falling apart, they're in the emergency rooms, they're in the intensive care units, uh, out of sight, out of mind in a certain way. But alcohol killed more than 2000 people in the state. The last year of data we have, yeah. the rate of alcohol related deaths in the state is three times the national average. And if you're concerned about fentanyl, opioids, methamphetamine, cocaine, as we should be, these are another big part of the dependence problem in New Mexico. 
alcohol killed more than all of those substances did combined. Um, so, so, you know, this is a, this is a huge challenge. And uh, those moments were, did get aired in the hearings. I will say um, a doctor from the Indian health, uh, the Gallup Indian Medical Center talked about watching her 30 year old patients die with fulminant liver failure. And um, the representative of the bill, Joan Ferrari shared that her niece had died a month before in an alcohol related fall, um, yielding, uh, you know, messages of condolence from across the room. So I think um, legislators too know and are affected by this issue. And, uh, you know, I think it rightly, they're making it a big part of the discussion up in Santa Fe this year. That's right. By the way, uh, Ted, we should let the folks know you were actually uh, from here. Uh, you're not here now. Um, tell folks a bit about your background and how you ended up in New York out of New Mexico. Well, I, I grew up in Albuquerque. I've raised there since I was a little kid. Um, I went back east to go to school and I've continued to work as a reporter, uh, both writing nationally for the New York Times, but I spent a lot of time in New Mexico and um, I care deeply about the place. So that's why I've taken such an interest, I guess, in the, measuring some of the public health outcomes there. And um, and so I'm, I'm grateful to have the partners in New Mexico in depth that I, that I do where I do a lot of my writing there. I mean, a seven part series is no joke and it was worthy of it because every word of it was apt, meaning the problem is so huge. There's so many angles. I, I appreciate you mentioning, I've forgotten her name, that uh, the woman that testified out of Grant, she was with us. Dr. Literally. Jenny May, yeah. That's right. That's right. She was amazing when she was on with you and I and others back in February. And I saw that testimony as well. I got to wonder if the medical, this is the reason I bring this up. Are we hearing enough from the people who deal with this a lot, meaning the medical community, EMS people? I, I just get the funny feeling if we had more time to really talk about this, folks would understand how, how deep the problem actually lies. You know, I, I'm just a, a fly on the wall during these hearings, so I can't take the full measure of the supporters and their opponents. But I will say uh, there's been a really robust lineup of people in all the hearings to comment in support of the bill, as well as the people who are opposing it. And um, in contrast to 2017, I will say I, I feel like there's a bit more diversity. Representative Joan Ferrari is still sponsoring the bill, but in the Senate, Senator Antoinette Cedillo Lopez is, um, and Senator Shannon Pinto, who represents McKinley and San Juan counties, has been a formidable voice there as well, speaking on the part of Native people, many of whom are our constituents, about how important this would be. Um, the behavioral health providers and the some of the recovery and treatment centers have been there. My, my sense is that a lot of the clinicians this year are focused on other legislation related to medical malpractice, which is another really challenging area that the, that the, uh, that the state is, is turning over, trying to make sure that independent providers don't face uh, intolerably high malpractice uh, um, fees to, to stay in the state. So maybe, maybe that will be drawing some of the oxygen away from this in terms of the clinician community. But the the problem for, for whatever happens in Santa Fe this year is not going to go away. I mean, alcohol related deaths have been climbing upward each year, and the problem has only gotten worse. Uh, you know, we have thirty percent more deaths this year than we did the last time they were talking about this measure. Hopefully, that won't be the case the next time they're talking about it. No joke. Hey, Ted, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And your partners at New Mexico in depth were crazy about those guys too. Certainly, in the great reporting you guys did together. I'm going to encourage you folks, if you're either just getting into this issue or you know about it and maybe need a little more in-depth knowledge, please go over Ted's seven-part series. It's worth every word. You'll learn a lot about New Mexico and what we need to do. It's, I, I took it as a call to action, so we'll see what happens. And by the way, I'm glad you mentioned Antoinette Cedillo Lopez. She's one of our old colleagues here at New Mexico in Focus. She used to be a panelist before she got appointed and then run for office. It's actually good to hear her voice on this. Ted, again, thank you. You're the man. And we'll talk to you again about this uh, at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> no doubt. Thank you. Take Thanks, care. Thanks, Ted. Appreciate it.